Well, good evening. It's good to be here with you. Um, we're going to be sticking with some of the lesser known stories of the Bible. It's been kind of fun going through <laughs> Kings and Chronicles and stuff because uh, we don't really spend a lot of time uh, reading those things, do we? But I think it's a good time in the evening to really think about some of these stories and how they apply to us even today, um, 3,000 years later. Uh, so, well, almost 3,000 years. Today we're going to be talking about King Amaziah, and he ruled from 796 to about 767. Um, it's about 30 years uh, in the kingdom, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. He was the ninth king of Judah. Um, what makes him kind of unusual uh, is that he is not exactly considered to be a bad king of Judah, but he wasn't considered to be a good one either. He was a, um, I guess you would just say, a, uh, a straddler on the fence of righteousness, right? He didn't commit one way or the other. And what happened as a result of that is that things at the end, well, they went bad. So this is what Second Chronicles uh, 25, 2 Chronicles 25.2 says. It says, he did right in the sight of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. So he just kind of committed halfway. Um, Amaziah was truly a mixed bag when it came to his dedication and his faithfulness to the Lord. He did some good things. He did some bad things. And we're going to talk about some of those. Well, as far as like what the good things he did, he started off his reign in an actually uh, righteous way. Uh, some people had assassinated his father, um, and so he sent out his men. He brought those people to justice, um, and he executed them. Now, the law of Moses said that it was wrong to execute that person's family, but back in those days, a lot of people, uh, in order to get rid of a problem, would not just get rid of the people that committed the crime, but everybody that was related to the person that uh, committed the crime because you didn't want to have future uh, people coming up and trying to get you to get even and all this other kind of stuff. But the law of Moses said this in Deuteronomy 24, 16, Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin kind of interesting, right? And, and you can kind of think of this too in a way to think about original sin, uh, that people are not guilty of the sins of those who committed them before. So you don't carry guilt or blood guilt or any other kind of guilt from people's sins that came before you from your father or your father's father or your father. Father's 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 father, 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 <laughs> right? Uh, what they you know, but what a lot of people say that believe in original sin say that you have the sin of Adam and that makes you guilty, right? So that's what original sin uh, is interpreted as uh, and by some, some other folks. But as you can see, people are not guilty of those sins. But anyway, this isn't the only place it says that either. It also says something similar in Ezekiel. Um, next, uh, after what, you know, Amaziah was good for doing that, so he gets some praise for that in the, in the scriptures. And next he goes to war with the Edomites. And he gathered up his forces and he hired mercenaries from the northern kingdom of Israel. And he agrees to pay them a hundred talents of silver. That's a lot of, that's a lot of silver. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a huge, pretty huge sum of money. But, you know, he gets, he's getting like a hundred thousand guys out of it. So... Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not too bad, so it's a fair deal. Uh, but a prophet comes up to Amaziah and he says, you know, Israel no longer serves the Lord, so you should not use mercenaries from Israel, uh, and you should tell them to go home. You know, that's what the Lord says. So Amaziah says, sure, okay. Uh, so he, he, all these 100,000 guys <laughs> come, and then they, uh, he tells them, you know, I'm not going to have you guys go down to war with me. Uh, whatever, right? So that he just sends them home. Uh, he goes, decides to go to war without them. And because he obeyed the prophet and he obeyed the word of the Lord, the Edomites are totally and utterly defeated. And they, 
and something like 20,000 Edomites are killed or executed from uh, the battle. And, and so that is considered to be a righteous move by him because he trusted God, he believed God, uh, and he was victorious because of his faithfulness to God. Um, but then things start to happen that we would consider to be mistakes according to the scripture. Um, and it's strange that even though God gave Amaziah victory over the Edomites, he still brings back the gods that he finds there and sets them up in Jerusalem and starts worshiping the gods of his defeated enemies. Uh, Amaziah also made a deal with the Israelite mercenaries to pay them a hundred talents of silver. And, uh, you know, he didn't want to, uh, he kind of welches on the deal, right? So he, he decides to keep the money uh, and send them home. Well, you know, they get pretty sore about that. Uh, they're not pretty happy because they all had to leave and come for this battle that maybe they didn't end up fighting, but they had to leave their city and everything uh, to begin with. And so on their way home, they ransack a bunch of vi villages in northern Judah and they kill like 3,000 people. Uh, and that's what the collateral damage is. So um, Amaziah, though, is feeling pretty good about his victory, and he's feeling pretty bad about these Israelites that just ransacked the northern part of his kingdom. So he, he's getting his dander up, right? And, and he's a pretty proud guy, and he thinks a lot of himself because of this victory. Um, but an unnamed prophet, doesn't tell us who it is, confronts Amaziah and says, you know, you shouldn't be worshiping these gods that come from the Edomites. They're called the, the gods of Seir. Seir is their capital city, the capital city in the, of the Edomite kingdom. Um, but he is... Um, you know, he doesn't take it well. And, and let's, take a, let's take a look at the scripture here. He says in 2 Chronicles 25, 14 through 16, it says, Now after Amaziah came from slaughtering the Edomites, he brought the gods of the sons of Seir, that's, that's the, uh, the city there, and set them up as gods, and bowed down before them and burned incense to them. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Amaziah, and he sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people who have not delivered their own people from your hand? Like, why are you worshiping them? Didn't God just give you these people into his hand? What is up with that? And then as he was talking with him, the king said to him, Have we appointed you a royal counselor? <laughs> like, who are you? You know? And then he says, Stop. Why should you be struck down? So he's like saying, Stop talking because basically... Uh, you don't need to be killed right now, but we're really, I'm really close to, do, to pulling the trigger on that, so you should get lost. And then he says, then the prophet stopped and he said, I know that God has planned to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. So after this exchange, things are set in motion for Amaziah's downfall, uh, and God is going to use Amaziah's weakness of pride in order to execute that downfall. Uh, and he was feeling, Amazon was feeling probably some sense of hurt pride and anger uh, at the northern kingdom because of these guys that just trashed the northern part of his territory. And so he wanted some revenge. Uh, and he challenges these guys to a fight, feeling like, oh, I just took the Edomites, I could take the northern kingdom of Israel too, but the northern kingdom of Israel is way bigger and way more powerful, especially at this time, than both Judah and Edom, and probably stronger than both of them put together. Um, and <laughs> but he's feeling pretty big, and so uh, this happens. Second Chronicles twenty-five seventeen through nineteen. It says, "Then Amaziah, king of Judah, took counsel and sent to Joash the son of Jehoahaz." the son of Jehu, the king of Israel, come let, us, um, come, let us face each other. And Joash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, the king of Judah, saying, the thorn bush, which was in Lebanon, sent to the cedar, which is in Lebanon, saying, give your daughter to my son in marriage. But there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trampled the thorn bush. You said, behold, you have defeated Edom, and your heart has become proud in boasting. Now stay at home, for why should you provoke trouble so that you, even you, would fall and Judah with you? So he's basically saying, I'm big, powerful cedar tree, and you're a little thorn bush. 
don't pick a fight with me, you're going to lose, <laughs> you're going to get trashed. And um, that's true, right? And, and it, it's fairly noble, Joash, to, to, to tell him that, right? He could have just said, okay, bring it, you know, but he doesn't do that. Um, and so Joash points out Amaziah's sin. He's pointing out his pride and his arrogance. And it, it is kind of ironic that the unbeliever is the one who is counseling the one who's supposed to be a believer. It's not a good look, right? So he tells him to stay home, don't start trouble, don't write checks that you can't cash, quit while you're ahead, or you're cruising for a bruising. I don't know, I couldn't think of any other ones, but basically, <laughs> that's what he's telling him, right? Uh, and because of his sin and his arrogance, he decides to pick the fight anyway, uh, and he lets the challenge stand, and so the northern kingdom invades and totally annihilates the Judean forces. So Amaziah uh, was prideful when he refused to obey God regarding worship of the Edomite god uh, of the Edomite gods, little g, and that same arrogance and that same unwillingness to listen to God's prophet is what led to his downfall. And he ends up getting captured. Um, he outlived Joash only to go home to be. Um, slaughtered by his own people, they decided to assassinate him. So he was assassinated, just like his father was also assassinated. So it's an interesting story, uh, but what can we learn from Amaziah? We can learn that God wants us not to follow him halfway, right? And the, the scriptures say he didn't follow God with his whole heart. He wasn't all the way there. You know, the rich young ruler comes to mind where Jesus said, to him uh, after the guy said, you know, what do I need to do? I've done all the things that are in the law. And he goes, well, sell all your possessions and give them to the poor and come and follow me. Because Jesus knew that was the one thing that he wouldn't give to God. Now, it doesn't mean that, doesn't, you know, the message we're not supposed to take from that or take from that is that you're just supposed to go sell everything you have right now. That's not what the point of it is. The point of it is that there should never be anything that holds us back to serving God fully. And now if it is our money or our wealth, if that's a stumbling block for us, then we're supposed to try to remove those stumbling blocks. We're supposed to put God first. We're not supposed to go halfway, like sort of worship God and sort of not, like keep some of this stuff for ourselves and give some to God. It's not, a, it's not an exchange. It's, it's all the way. Uh, it, and that's essentially the message of Jesus, too. In Matthew 6, 24, he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. And here he's talking about somebody having money as their master. But it doesn't matter what it is. If there's anything in your life that is supplanting where God is supposed to be, you have to pull that up and get that out of the way. That's like a weed that's grown in the garden. And you know what happens to weeds. If you just leave one there, what's going to happen in a week? You're going to see another one and another one and another one. And then they just continue to grow and take up more and more space until they have infected and taken over the entire garden. So you have to pull up the weeds. You have to get those things out of your life, right? That's what we all have to do. And, and that's what Amaziah did not do. It started with a small pride problem, and it blew up into a huge one that ultimately led to him dying and actually the city of Jerusalem uh, being ransacked and stuff being stolen out of the temple and stuff like that. But anyway, um, it's important to remember that when we become obsessed with anything or anything comes before us and God, whether it's worry or anxiety when we don't give God the glory, uh, and give him the thanks for the good things that we have in our life when we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. You know, all those things are ways that we do not give God our whole heart. We're holding back a portion of ourselves, and we're trying to maintain some sort of control over our life. And that is what a Christian does not do. A Christian leaves the control to God. They put their faith and their trust in God. Uh, the kernel that we hold back for ourselves and refuse to give to God will eventually be the thing that sprouts and gives us a, pro a problem later. <clears throat> so whatever it is that's holding you back from fully committing 
yourself to God, well, you have to take that out of the way. We all do. That's something that we all have to work on. And for every person, it's different. For Amaziah, it was his pride. But for me, it could be something different. For you, it could be something different. We don't know what it is. For the rich young ruler, it was his money, right? Whatever it is. Uh, but we have to give it all to God. And I just wanted to share this uh, passage with you. Uh, it comes from Matthew 13, 44. And Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells everything that he has, and he buys that field. So he decides to give up everything for God. There's nothing between him and God. There's nothing that he won't do. And that's really the message about Amaziah, about what the, the New Testament tries to teach us about our relationship to God, that you have to give it up in order to find eternal life. You have to sell all those things. You have to get rid of all those things holding you down and holding you back uh, in your life. And you have to go and buy that field so you can get that treasure. So if you're struggling with pride, you have to give up that pride. If you're struggling with envy, you've got to give up that envy. If you're struggling with malice or anger or bitterness, you have to let those things go. Greediness, let it go. Our whole hat, heart has to be inclined to faithfulness and obedience to God. And we're not going to be perfect, but we have to pursue that purpose. That's what it means to believe in Him and trust in Him with our life is that we're going to let go of the things that we're inclined to do through our sins and do what he wants us to do instead. We're going to trust in him. So we can learn from Amaziah that God wants us also to listen to his counsel and not be too proud or rebellious to accept the truth. Sometimes things happen in life and they're a pretty strong message from God. They're meant to treat, teach us something about our life. And we have to be humble enough to learn those lessons and to let those things guide us. It says that God is opposed to the proud, the scriptures say that, but he gives grace to the humble. God is willing to work with you and love you and take you into himself all day if we're willing to, to, to obey and trust in him with our life. You know, Amaziah was a proud man, and he found himself at odds with God. He threatened even God's own prophet. And likewise, when we're prideful, we're going to find ourselves uh, far from God also. So let us pray that we follow God with not just half a heart, but our whole heart. And not to worship the idols of this world. The idols which God has defeated through the power of His Son, Jesus Christ. So let us pray that God will help us listen to His counsel and not be too proud or rebellious to accept what he has to say. And let us pray that God will help us trust in his faithfulness and his justice to receive his grace and mercy through his son Jesus. At this time, I'm going to offer that invitation, and we're going to sing a closing song, which is, I Am Resolved. Now, if you want to give yourself to Jesus today, if you want to dedicate your life and your heart, your whole heart to him, and you believe in him, and you trust in him, and you want to confess to him that he is your Lord and Savior, and you're willing to repent of your sins and be baptized in commitment to him, you can receive forgiveness, the forgiveness of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. I encourage you to come forward as we sing, I am resolved.